Here's Nearer, My God, to Thee, composed by John Turner. everyone, friends and neighbors, to the North Kent Presbyterian Church online worship experience. As the number of vaccinations in our county increases, we look forward to the day when we can worship face to face again. But until then, we must not tire of protecting our friends and we will continue to avoid any physical contact. We do this because we, were, we are followers of Christ who calls on us to practice agape, or self-sacrificial love. So welcome to our online service, and thank you for joining us for worship. Thank you to everyone who responded so generously to the Mission Committee's urgent call for boots for Mel Trotter Mission. In one week, we had 25 pairs of new or very gently used boots donated, 49 pairs of socks, and miscellaneous hats, scarves, jackets, and gloves were all collected. Everything was delivered on Monday, and everything was very much appreciated. So thank you. It's way to go. One great hour of sharing challenge. Traditionally during Lent, we save our loose change in fish-shaped banks, and then we bring those boxes to church on Easter. This year, you're being challenged to create your own fish bank. Can you make a fish bank out of a spaghetti box? Or do you have a better idea? Send in your photos of your coin receptacles to Pastor Karen before March 21st, and she'll use them in a sermon. Next Sunday, March 14th, is daylight savings time. We will spring forward an hour in time. Well, we will meet for worship at 1045 it's going to feel like 9.45, so be sure to set your alarms. April Fool's Day is coming. If you'd like to participate in a church-wide April Fool's Day event, please email Pastor Karen to sign up. You will be assigned one person or family upon which you will pull a humorous and benign April Fool's Day caper. Will you send them a prank email? Or will you bake them a batch of hilarious cookies? Get creative and fun. No destructive or mean pranks, please. And no April Fool's Day this year falls on Monday, Thursday. 
Easter morning parking lot event at 9 a.m. Save the date on your calendar. Sunday, April 14th, NKPC is planning a special COVID safe in-person parking lot event. You're invited to join us. A full Easter morning worship experience will also be available online that morning at 1045. Please join me in the call to worship. This week, we are again working through the parables of Jesus, and today we're talking about a generous God. Come now to worship the God who is the very definition of generosity and who calls each of us to be generous as well. Dear God, open our hearts to fresh ways to serve you and your world. Open our minds to new ways of sharing all that you have given to us. Open our souls so that we may be fulfilled and filled with your generous, overflowing love and forgiveness. join me in the prayer of confession. Dear God, you are the God of generosity. You gave all of yourself through Jesus Christ so that we could have life. Forgive us for not following your example. In our culture of abundance, we have more of everything than we really need. We rent buildings to sort, store our excess. We believe that we need more and more of everything in order to be satisfied and happy. Forgive us for our selfishness, our gluttony of things, and our wastefulness. Continue to call us to a life of generosity. Show us daily how we may meet the needs of others and be good stewards of all that you have given. Open our hearts and minds and hands so that we may give to all who have need. Amen. And now hear the assurance of God's pardon and God's forgiveness. Please turn and say these words to your neighbor or say them to yourself. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done or what has been done to you, the love and the grace of God is greater than our brokenness. I assure you that through the work of Jesus Christ, we are all completely forgiven. Glory to God. 
through 16, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found others still standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to, on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those of us who were hired last, those, those who were hired last work only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you. Friend, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Savior, holy thine, 
Let me feel thy Holy Spirit Truly know that thou art mine I surrender all I surrender all All to thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all All to Jesus I surrender chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. When scholars analyze the artistic work of the Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh, no summary of his life's work is complete without talking about how frequently van Gogh returned to the subject of painting a sower in the field. It was a subject that he painted both as a beginning artist and then later on in his life as well. You see, when Van Gogh was a budding artist, one of the most successful artists that he wanted most to emulate was a man by the name of Jean-Francois Millet. Millet, like Van Gogh, came from humble beginnings, and Millet received his fame 
by realistically painting rural scenes and by treating farm workers and agricultural work in a positive light. Millet's best known painting, The Gleaners, showed the ancient custom of poor women picking up the spilled and forgotten grains of wheat that had been dropped to the ground after the harvest. The three women shown in the painting are the people at the bottom of the French society social ladder. Yet, Malay takes great care to paint those forgotten people in a beautiful golden light. They almost appear heroic in their struggle to pick up the individual grains of wheat in order not to starve. In the distant background of the painting, there are sacks of grain in a thriving, rich farm that the three women are literally very far away from. Now, the initial reaction toward Millet's painting was hostile. The upper echelons of French society that entertained themselves with purchasing art did not want to be reminded of the masses of poor agricultural people who struggled in poverty beneath them. And the fact that Malay had painted these peasant women in their plain homespun clothes in such an ungallant bending over pose on a huge canvas, one usually reserved for saints and war heroes, caused quite a scandal in the French art world in 1857. Today, we have our own characters in our society that fill, fill the role of gleaners. On Wednesday, when I went to the Marathon gas station to fill up my car, I took care not to hit a man who was walking around the gas pumps. He was unshaven and disheveled, and he wore a dirty coat. In his hand, he held a thin, clear garbage bag that I could see was filled with returnable bottles and cans. One by one, he went to every trash can by the gas pumps and he bowed and bent over each one. He rooted through the trash that everyday people had left in those trash cans. He picked up and looked under the fast food containers and the paper cups and the old used Kleenex and the smeared napkins. He was looking for the discarded bottles and cans that he could add to his bag and return at the gas station for cash. After I filled up my car with gas and got into line for the car wash, after some time, this same man walked past the back of my car toward the family fair parking lot. The bag of cans and bottles that had been in his hand was now gone, and there was determination in his step as he took the most direct route toward the store's front doors. Perhaps he had gleaned enough from his harvesting of the lost and forgotten returnable cans to feed himself for another day. Before Millet painted the Gleaners in 1857, he also had gotten some attention for his painting called The Sower in 1850. And while Van Gogh imitated the paintings of both Millet's Gleaners and Sowers, it was the image of the sower that most frequently captured Van Gogh's imagination. Over the course of his artistic career, Van Gogh painted images of a sower over 30 times. While in the earliest parts of his career, Van Gogh tried to imitate the style and the feel of Millet's work, it was only later on in his life that Van Gogh's own original interpretation of the sower with his dramatic and bright purple and yellow colors brought him significant acclaim as an artist. In Van Gogh's most famous version of the sower, there is a brown tree in the foreground and a huge yellow setting sun gives a halo to the common worker scattering his seeds indiscriminately on the purple and orange ground. Not even the shade of the tree was going to stop the sower from casting his seeds there in the possibility that the seed may take the opportunity given to it and still grow up and bring forth a bountiful harvest despite the situational challenges that it faced. In these two characters, the gleaners and the sowers, we find excellent illustrations of the differences between humans and God. Our human society is very good 
at creating the conditions for gleaners to exist. We make resources scarce and hard to get. We create the economic situations where people are forced to scrounge and to dig for cast aside and forgotten scraps in order to survive. The age-old custom of gleaners picking up the individual grains from the dirt has now been institutionalized with people having to fill out endless amounts of paperwork and to stand in line at food banks. They live on the forgotten food that other people have cleaned out from their pantries. The occasional person who we see digging through trash cans at gas stations looking for bottles doesn't even strike us as odd or unusual anymore. Yet our human desire to keep everything for ourselves and to hoard more and more while others struggle with so little that is completely opposite to the generous nature of our God. In our first scripture lesson today, we have an indication of just how generous God is to all people, even those who do not deserve it. The story shocks us, it surprises us. The landowner would have been perfectly within his rights to only pay those who worked one hour a fraction of what he gave to those people who had worked the whole day. Both in the first century and today, it is the expected things to do. Even today, if you are an hourly employee, you don't get paid for the hours that you didn't work. If the landowner had followed the usual way of doing things, he could have maximized his profits. He could have had enough money left over to hire even more workers the next morning. But instead of being a good and savvy businessman, the landowner instead generously put the welfare of the laborers above his own profits. This is the big point of this parable, the part that surprises us today. Who has ever heard of a boss paying for work that wasn't done? Who has ever heard of giving someone a chance when it is really unlikely that they will take it? But that is part of the point. Our God is not about business as usual. Our God is not about earning your way. Our God is about generously giving chances again and again, over and over again, in order for people to be experience God's love, forgiveness, grace, and salvation. You cannot earn your way into heaven. It is a free, generous gift. When we think about the different people that we encounter every day, it is easy to put them into the categories of the different soils from the parable of the sower. We all know people who don't understand what it means to be a Christian. They have been conned into thinking that faith in God means that you are stupid or a fairy tale believing fool. For them, the message of God's self-sacrificial love for everyone is dismissed even before it has a chance to grow in their hearts. For others, Christianity is something that they at least tried to implement in their lives, but they don't get rooted in a church community of friends, and their faith often quickly dries up and blows away in the wind of their busy schedules. We all know people from whom their own pleasure and entertainment takes precedent over having a life of faith. The thorns of money, fame, and leisure soon overpower their impulse to live their lives for God and the impulse of God's self-sacrificial love for God and for their neighbor gets choked out and it dies out slowly, one weekend trip at a time. My friends, in conclusion, the generosity of our God stands in complete contrast to the base impulses of humanity. While we hoard our resources and rent out storage units to keep more stuff, our God is quietly, ever waiting for us with open arms, ready to give us a second chance, ready to reward each of us. It doesn't matter if you are young and at the beginning of your life or if you are old and near your deathbed. Each of us has the opportunity to answer the call of God, to open our hearts, to become that good soil. Because when we open our hearts to the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, 
We are not only open to God changing us completely, but we are given that gift of eternal life in the presence of the God that we love. Today, my friends, the seed of God's generous love is being offered to each of us. Will you open your heart and accept it? Will you let it live and grow in you? I pray that we all will. So be it. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadow Sing 
because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, we celebrate today your generosity. We celebrate that you are a God of healing. We give you thanks that Fran Roberts' niece, Brooke, is now in remission from her MS. We celebrate some successful surgeries for breast cancer for both Fran Roberts' niece, Jan Barnhart, and for North Kent Presbyterian friend, Julie Haggerty. We also give you thanks, dear God, for Sue Rabeck's friend, Joanna, who is now off chemo and doing well. We pray for Jessie Howell, a former member of North Kent. We thank you for her improvement and that she is now back in her own apartment. Dear God, we give you thanks that progress is being made in the vaccination of people in our county and in our state and in the country. Dear God, help the manufacturers to keep producing the vaccines and give us strength for the long journey of vaccinating all who desire it. Dear God, we give, you, we give you thanks for all that you are doing and we pray for everyone in our country who is fighting COVID and is still sick. We pray for all of the healthcare workers and those essential employees on the front lines. We pray also for the, everyone who is fighting cancer for Susan Lokers, Angie Ferguson. We pray for Michelle Mucha, for Chet Knox's sister-in-law, Gloria, for her pancreatic cancer. We pray for Laura Weld's cousin, Mary Ruth, and for Hal Ringler. We pray and remember Kurt Westerhoff, the friend of Mark Bennett. And we pray for everyone struggling with depression. We pray for marriages that are broken and for people and relationships that need healing. We pray for those who are dealing with fibromyalgia and glaucoma. We pray for those dealing with addictions, those who find themselves homeless. We pray for Camp Greenwood for the new camping season, which has opened for registrations. And we pray for our country and for how we divided we are. We give you thanks, dear God, that Chris Shear's mother-in-law is now celebrating her 100th birthday. Help us here in this time and place to be the disciples that you want us to be as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, this is the Lord's table. Everyone, yes, everyone is welcome. There are no exceptions, no age limits, no discrimination. We come not because we are whole, but because we are broken. We come not because we are full of piety, but because we are hungry for God's love and grace. We do not come with all of the answers. We all come with questions and with wonder. If you would like to join us for communion, you are welcome. You are joyously invited to do so. This is for all of you. Please join me in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us welcome one another with the peace of Christ. 
At this time, please turn and greet your neighbors by saying, the peace of the Christ be with you, and respond by saying, and also with you. My friends, our God in Christ breaks down the walls that makes us strangers to ourselves and divides us from one another. We are the body of Christ. Around this table, we enact our faith. The body broken is restored to wholeness. Christ's lifeblood poured out brings healing to our world. Please join me in the Eucharistic prayer. Dear God, we long for community, but in our brokenness, we label one another and we call our brothers and our sisters strangers. Yet you call us by name. With arms outstretched as on a cross, you call us to yourself and you name us as your own children. So with our arms outstretched, we now embrace new friends and create a new community. Your body that was broken and your lifeblood poured out transform our fears and revive our visions. You help us to celebrate our diverse gifts and to work for your peace and your justice throughout the world. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had supped, in the same way also he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Will you please join me in the prayer after communion? We thank you, God, for loving us, for your body broken like bread and for your blood poured out like wine. We are humbled and grateful. We praise and thank you for this community you are building here in this time and place and for the restoration that you give to us each and every day. Strengthen us and give us the courage to be the people of your peace. As we reach out our hands to care for our neighbors, Help us to bring acceptance and healing. Inspire us to work for justice and to be agents of peace. For it is your power that does all of these things, and we give to you all of the glory and the praise. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace. Give you peace. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious unto to you. Amen. Amen. bless you and keep you. May God's face shine down with love upon you. May God be gracious to you 
and to the whole world, no exceptions, God's amazing love and peace. And all of God's people said, Amen. Go in peace. Here's a traditional hymn attributed to Harry Dixon Lowe's and arranged by Mark Hayes. 